Hello everybody, Brad the Guitologist here with another immensely exciting video for you. In this video, we're going to take a look at an amp we uh, don't get to see very much. This is a late 1950s Epiphone Century amplifier. You don't see very many Epiphones actually in this uh, sort of covering. This is right after Gibson purchased Epiphone in the mid-50s. And so these were kind of the first run of Epiphone amplifiers. And you can see here it has kind of a wheat sort of a grill. This looks very much like something that would have been on Fender amplifiers in the early 60s, kind of with the, uh, uh, the brown face era. Interesting Epiphone logo there. It's sort of a triangular shape or a horn shape I guess you could say with a weird looking bullet shaped thing underneath the Epiphone insignia then you've got this kind of uh, diamond pattern in the covering and the covering itself is made from uh, it's it's kind of silvery actually if you get it if you get it in the right light it shines in a very silvery way just an interesting, interesting uh, color scheme. Really, really sharp looking amplifier. Same uh, Gibson style handle. These are the suitcase handles that you see on a lot of suitcases in the 1950s. Uh, and this amplifier has a counterpart in the Gibson lineup as most, if not all, Epiphones did. Uh, this one is labeled the Century. The Gibson counterpart is the GA20T. I've actually demonstrated uh, a couple of different GA20Ts on my channel before. Really fantastic amps. This one, if anybody's if anybody's counting, has serial number in the 36,000 range, and it is just in very very pretty condition. Of course it has tremolo with uh, depth and rate on channel 2. And channel 2 also, uh, just like the Gibson counterpart, the GA20T, it has uh, a pentode up front in the first stage on channel 2. We'll take a look at all that stuff when we uh, yank the chassis out of here. Original speaker, and this one is dated, of course, 220 is Jensen, 902, that is the second week of 1959. So it's a 1959 amplifier. Also included with this one is the original foot switch, and they're almost never missing. And that's because they're hardwired into the amplifiers. There's no plug and unplug. Another peculiar thing about this is the way the way the bottom is on it. You see the front edge on the bottom. Kind of has an kind of has an angled thing going on. But anyway, let's get this one inside. Get it up on the bench. Uh, take a closer look at it see what's wrong with it. We probably plug it in first and kind of test it and play around with it. Uh, and then we'll get inside and see what needs to be done. Okay, here we are with this thing fired up on the bench. Right now I'm going into channel one. And I've got the volume just really low. seems actually just a-okay. I don't see any problems with it. The tone knob works, volume knob works. Let's see channel two. I think he said something was wrong with this tremolo. And that 
that does appear to be the case. Um, there is something wrong with the tremolo. It's not working properly. Again, the tone knob works fine. But the more you crank this, I mean, that you, that you're talking. I mean, this thing can rock. But yeah, it looks like we need to service this tremolo. All right, here she is out open on the bench, and we'll get a look at what uh, we've got ourselves into here. Um, as you can see, it has already been recapped. Somebody put Sprague Atom capacitors in here. Uh, but what's the other thing that you notice about this board? There's a very distinct lack of capacitors. We have one, two, three capacitors, all of which are original Astrons. That's an Astron, that's an Astron, and that's an Astron. Very much like you would see in a 1950s era uh, Fender. But where are the rest of the capacitors? Um, yes, that's right. They are underneath this board. Um, on these old 50s Gibsons, this is one of the downfalls of these. And I have no idea, uh, no understanding whatsoever uh, why a company would do this to any lowly repair person. But they have stuck most of the capacitors underneath that board right there. So in order to service this properly, we are going to have to yank this board out and replace the capacitors probably in the uh, tremolo section. This model is the uh, EA25 Century. And if we look here, again we have two channels on this thing. The first channel has a 12AY7 uh, as the first tube and uh, each input uses one half of the tube independently. 12AX7 over here for the phase inverter and this after the volume control here for the channel. The tone control is shared by both channels. As you can see right here the second channel which features a 5879 pentode into this weird network of uh, resistors and capacitors which is doing some tone shaping here into the volume pot and it ties back in to here before heading out to the phase inverter and the output uh, but the tone control here is going to also be effective and you can tell also because it ties in here this other volume control is also going to be effect effective this is why these volumes are interactive on these two channels and that is that way from the factory uh, because they are both tied in together on one of their legs. You can see right there and the tone is also tied in. That's why it acts as it does on both channels. Um, but yeah, the second channel with this 5879, uh, even if they just omitted this right here, just this channel, uh, this is one of the best sounding vintage amplifier channels uh, of all time but we're gonna have to get in here and probably replace these 0 .05 capacitors right here and if these capacitors are bad I'm guessing they're probably the same Astrons um, probably the mustard type Astrons that we've seen on the top and if one or more of those is bad these other ones are probably also bad and I'm I'm willing to bet uh, leaky. I'm very much willing to bet that that these Astrons are, if they're not gone, they're on they're on their way out. And it would probably be wise to go ahead and replace those. The reason being, if you leave in coupling capacitors like these point zero twos right here, for instance, okay, these uh, are the coupling capacitors that prevent the high voltage. Uh, DC from leaking across over here onto the grid of the output tube. If that happens and when that happens what ends up happening is it just burns up these output tubes because it over biases them. 
and they'll just glow red hot until they basically self-destruct. It's probably time for these to come out of here. I know they look cool. I know it's cool to have, oh man, you know, it's all original or whatever, and I don't like co replacing components necessarily willy-nilly, but but man, this thing is from 1959, and these, these are not renowned for holding up very well. So I will try replacing this first to see if that does anything. But I do know that the control, the uh, depth control on the Tremola circuit was doing some weird funky whoosh 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 stuff which is telling me that there, there's something wrong with the capacitors in that circuit and it's probably time for this thing to have, um, you know, to have a serious overhaul rather than just a uh, cursory one. Uh, I think it would be foolish to get in here, take this board out flip it up, which is what I'm going to have to do, and start replacing capacitors on the tremolo circuit and not go ahead and address the rest of the capacitors in this amp because, uh, frankly, these Astrons are probably, they're probably ready to go. Okay, to pull this board, we have a couple of uh, mounts here that we need to unscrew, and hopefully this thing will just flip up, flip up this way. Uh, with this side coming upward um, and we'll we'll check out what's underneath there I could get an inspection mirror and kind of slip it under the side probably and see see a little bit but um, there's no point I know I'm gonna have to probably get in there anyway uh, I will go ahead first though and check this tube before we do anything else so let me dig up a uh, 6SQ7 I'm not sure why that says 67Q7 that's that's wrong obviously Okay, I found a, a Joint Army Navy. That's what JAN stands for, in case you didn't know. Joint Army Navy. So this was a military tube, 6SQ7. And the manufactured date on this is 8, uh, be August of 1962. So let's stick it in and see if that was the problem. The tremolo is usually so deep on these Gibson amps that you can tell right away if uh, the tremolo is working even without a guitar plugged in, usually because it'll, you can just kind of turn up the volume and hear if it's going vo, 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 vo. Yeah, see, I don't, this isn't going to do it. It starts for a second and then kind of dies out when you first hit it. It tries to get going but can't do it because it's got one or more bad capacitors and I think they stuck those sprayed capacitors in the Tremolo circuit. So uh, I'm going to have to call the customer. I know I'm going to have to replace those sprayed capacitors uh, in the Tremolo circuit at least. And while I'm in here, um, I'm just going to be straight up and honest with him and let him know it's probably for the best to replace the lot. Okay, it's been a little while now and the capacitors for this Epiphone Century have arrived. We have ordered some blue Sozos. Those are going to replace the yellow Astrons. And we've also ordered some orange drops, which I don't normally stock these. I normally, uh, uh, just as a standard, I normally go with the red Panasonic type poly capacitors uh, but for this I'm going to use these and they should be a good replacement for all of these sprags. Now you may be asking yourself why would I change all of the capacitors in this vintage amplifier um, without testing each one first and leaving the ones that are good in and so forth. The main reason is this most of the capacitors on this board are on the bottom side of the board, which is uh, difficult to access. We're going to have to remove one, two, three, four, five, six already, perhaps seven uh, different wires and lift this board up to even see the bottom of the board. And I may have to remove some more wires uh, in order to access it to the point where I can get my soldering iron on those. Uh, but the reason to, to do that, to replace those now, is because uh, we could get away with uh, the customer only having to be in here one time, probably probably in his lifetime, because these 
capacitors over here, the power capacitors are already replaced with some nicer sprigs. Um, and we already know for a fact that at least the tremolo capacitors are, are gone because the tremolo is not working at all. Uh, and we're going to have to take this board out anyway to replace those, those capacitors and also this little electrolytic right here. Uh, so we're going to have to get up under this board anyway. And while we're up under here, there's really no reason to leave these old capacitors in here. And, you know, again, it's a controversial thing to do. Uh, in the past, I have kind of been against it. But when you have a situation like this, where, the, where you have an amplifier full of capacitors, like these Astrons and like these Sprague Bumblebees that are, uh, that are notorious for being leaky and going leaky, there's no reason to leave these in here. Um, they are just going to cause problems in the near future. Even if they're good now, they probably are not going to be good um, for that much longer. They're certainly not going to be good as long as these new capacitors are going to be if I go ahead and put those in now. So it's, an, it's a long-term investment. I've already run this by the customer. I've given him um, my recommendation on it, and he's accepted it, and I think he's made the right choice. So we're going to replace these capacitors in this amplifier all of them. Okay, so there are all the leads desoldered from the board and now I can at least lift it up enough to see the components underneath and you can see what I mean. You see all these capacitors that are under here? Uh, there are actually a couple of things that we're going to do with these new capacitors. Not only are we going to replace all of the older ones here, uh, we're also going to move them from the bottom of the board to the top of the board. Uh, again, I know that's another controversial move, and it's even controversial in my own head right now, to be honest with you. I've done it successfully before uh, on a couple of, uh, or well, at least on one that I remember, Gibson Amplifier, where I um, uh, basically rewired that whole thing and restored it. And it worked out a lot better with all these on the top of the, that board. Um, I think this is going to be a lot better as well. Now it's going to make it difficult to get to some of these resistors, um, but essentially if you ever had to change one of those resistors, all you would have to do is remove uh, one capacitor to get it out of the way to, to remove the resistor underneath it. So not an enormous deal really. Um, and it's going to really make this thing a lot more serviceable in the future, a lot more easily uh, serviceable. These double lot five capacitors right here in channel two, uh, these are part of a tone shaping network. They have a double lot five and a one meg, double lot five, one meg, and so forth. There's five of those capacitors in a, in a row, uh, in series, and uh, before this uh, one meg pot. Right, it's these five. This one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. Those five right there. It's interesting that the first one in the sequence is uh, is an Astron. Now. I wonder, it kind of makes you wonder whether Gibson knew that these uh, Bumblebee capacitors were really unfit, you know, in a high voltage setting because they've got this Astron right here, which is basically taking care of the, um, the DC and not allowing that to pass. So the high voltage DC is really only hitting the Astron. And then after that, you've got the four remaining bumblebee capacitors uh, so it kind of makes you wonder whether Gibson knew about this and put that Astron there on purpose okay this is interesting just like they had the one Astron in that five capacitor sequence on channel two they also have these three capacitors right here which are the uh, phase shifting capacitors in the tremolo oscillator circuit the Astron that we see here is the one that is uh, also hooked to, if we were to follow that blue wire right there, we would see that is hooked to the plate of the 6SQ7. So that's interesting that Gibson were using these Astrons because they suspected or knew uh, that uh, those were better for filtering or excuse me, for blocking the DC. Uh, so they did it here in this circuit, and they did it here in the tremolo circuit as well. So what I've decided to do is change just the first Astron, and I've changed it here to a an orange drop, and I'm going to leave these four 
Sprague's in here because they have they should never have seen uh, DC in their life, and they should be okay. This is all low uh, voltage circuitry right here. This is one example where you just you know you kind of got to think on the fly on these things and. Uh, if you need to change direction, then go ahead and change direction. There's no reason not to. We are, however, going to change these three, which are in the tremolo circuit, and we're going to change this one as well. But I just thought that was interesting, that they were either moving, um, Gibson at this time was e either moving, it's a transitional thing, uh, or they were doing this on purpose to use up some old stock, uh, but they didn't want to move completely they didn't want to use them all up at once because they wanted to, uh, you know, move to the Astrons um, in, you know, appropriate positions. Just an interesting thing. Okay, so there we have it. Here's the whole thing wired up and complete. It looks pretty good. It doesn't look too crowded, actually, with all the stuff on the top. Now, granted, we are missing a few components that are still on the bottom. There's one resistor uh, that's still over here underneath, and the four capacitors are right in kind of this area, <clears throat> the ones that I left. And we'll fire it up on the Variac, and uh, then we'll give it a test. Also change it to a three-prong cord. So, yeah, this thing's ready to rock. Let's go ahead and test it out. Okay, I have this thing plugged in and dialed up on the Variac, and it's on. I'm getting a lot of static. And I'm not 100% sure where it's coming from, so let's investigate that a little bit. And now it's still there. And that's actually why I have this ring on here right now, because um, this, this tube is a little bit noisy. It's got kind of a glassy ring to it. Oh, that's another quirk of these also I forgot about. If you pull the V1 tube on these, uh, it actually increases the power for channel 2. Still got a lot of trash and noise and stuff in, in the amp, so let's, let's pop it back open and uh, do some more digging. Okay, we're going to try our trusty old chopstick method uh, to see if we can't locate the issue. I'm assuming uh, because of the nature of this that it could be related to uh, bad solder or bad resistor. Could also be a bad capacitor. Shouldn't be one of our new ones. But you never know. There's something right there. Hear that? I'm suspecting that resistor right there, possibly. That's a very microphonic connection right there. Listen to that. Whoa. 
See, that shouldn't be doing anything. That should be grounded. So why is that not grounded? Why is that not grounded? Is it... Hmm. Yeah, I'll just, I'll clean these inputs. Take them out, drop them out as well and make sure they're getting good ground connection because this is a painted chassis so they may not be getting good ground connection here or the ground bus maybe isn't connected well. I don't know, we'll see. Okay, so I cleaned the controls and I cleaned, uh, or cleaned the controls and I cleaned the input jacks and even wide open. I'm not getting any of that crackling and stuff anymore. So I think this thing is about ready for a test drive. While we're at it here inside this thing, I wanted to give you another unexpected lesson uh, in the effects of shielding. Now I have a fluorescent light right above this amp, so we're getting a lot of noise right now, and the thing's cranked on the uh, the second channel, which is the pinto channel. And this will also give you a lesson on how noisy pinto tubes can be. Um, I can cast my shadow over the input area. And that cuts down on the noise immensely. So that should tell you something about the importance of shielding your inputs. Uh, secondly, the importance of shielding your tubes, especially if it's a pinto. Listen to this. Definitely a difference. The biggest effect is shielding those inputs. And the thing about these amps is that they have no shielding on the inside of the... Well, let's see, it should go this way. Except for the wood itself, there's really no shielding. So if you really want this thing to be quiet, there needs to be some shielding right here. So I think what I'm going to do uh, is get some shielding, some aluminum shielding tape, and uh, just tape up an area right here where the where the inputs lie, right in this area. It'll have the greatest effect. I'm also going to use uh, some tube shields from my stash and supply them with just a whole set of these tube shields for for all of his tubes on the preamp. There's no reason to roll with these unshielded, particularly uh, when they came shielded from the factory uh, and you have a pin toad on that second channel, which is going to be very noisy if you don't shield that. Okay, we have our tube shields installed. Uh, we have some aluminum uh, shielding tape installed on this back door, and that's going to shield the input. And we're ready to give this thing a listen.
So now that concludes our presentation on this 1959 Epiphone Century amplifier. Hope you guys have enjoyed it. Uh, hit the subscribe button if you have. And for now, y'all take care.